So let's see. Um, so yeah, we got involved. We did all these things. We went bump in the night. The FBI was at the um, at the mine site when we went to um, to cut down the paralyzed going into the mine, and it was one of the most wonderful experiences I'll ever remember um, because we cut down 27 uh, power lines. They were just the little uh, wooden ones, and. Um, and we ended up, you know, about three of them went down because we cut through half of them, but we didn't go all the way through. And so they came back later on. I went up there and they had these steel plates on both sides of these. It was hilarious um, that were, you know, holding them up. But the fireball went from when we finally dropped that one and it went all the way to where the mine was and just kind of blew up all the lights in the mine. Nobody got hurt. It pissed the feds off really pissed the mine people off because when they were in court years later, there's the guy, the mine guy, finds out that the FBI was all over the woods that night and did not stop us. <laughs> and years later when I was working at a crisis youth shelter, one of the girls that I was working with who worked a night shift as well said, yeah, and she told me about this experience she had in the middle of the, in the middle of the, her and her five kids went out camping with her husband and they were in, the area, and there was cops everywhere, and they're like, what is going on? Oh my God. So I have evidence. It wasn't like they, you know, they, were, they didn't say they were there. We found out, you know, the lawyers found the stuff out. We got them to admit it while the minor was standing there, on, sitting there on the stand. It was, it was great. So there were a lot of moments, you know, going through this trial that were hilarious, but um, I was terrified most of the time and still was able to laugh. So we got caught because uh, the FBI agent got really involved with us and he went on the, on the recon for the next deal, which was to cut down a big high tension power line going to a pump station where, you know, in Arizona there's not that much water. So they're pumping water out of the Colorado River and they're taking it to Phoenix and Tucson. In order to, for them to do that, they have to pump it uphill. So they're using electricity that they're getting off the dams to pump the water uphill so that they can have it over in, in, in Tucson and Phoenix. So we decided, well, if we cut a power line in one of those areas, it's not going to be, you know, messing up a hospital. It's not going to hurt. You know, it won't be something that the feds can grab onto and make us into terrorists, we thought. So, um, <coughs> Davis was always talking about the, um, the there was, Things that happened at the power plant, the nuclear power plant down at Fort Palo Verde, that I don't know who it was that did any of this stuff, but there was people that like shorted out some of the the um, high tension wires that were going into the plant. So, um, or maybe it was, they were shorting them that was going out of the plant. I'm not quite sure. I think it was one that one that was going out of the plant because you don't want to short them going into the plant because then you can have a meltdown. So it was the the stuff that was going out of the plant. And the feds just were positive that we were involved. And we were like, we don't care about, I mean, we care about keeping the uranium in the ground. We are at the point of production. That's our deal. We don't care. I mean, we, there's nothing, we're, that's for other people. That's for the nuclear resistor. That's for the people that are doing that kind of stuff. We're, we're the wilderness people. That's what we want to do. So, um, so that was how, so the feds were determined to connect us with that. And of course, Never happened, but the but the feds really got Mark Davis really excited about taking out. You know, he would oh God. he would talk about the Diablo Canyon. He would talk about um, oh, what's the one over in Colorado? It's a it's a great it's a big uh, nuclear place. Rocky Mountain Flats. Right, Rocky Flats. So he was talking about Rocky Flats, he was talking about Diablo Canyon, he was talking about Palo Verde with the informant because the informant was goading him on all about, you know, let's talk, you know, let's talk trash, man. And so, and the FBI was trying very, very hard to get us to do explosives or fires or anything, arms, we just pick up a pop gun, we don't care, we just want you to shoot something. And we're all, like, we're like, we're pacifists, man. So, the informant and the FBI were very active in trying to get us somehow. And Mark Davis was starting, no, no, we can't do this, we can't do this. But they would, you know, inch up on us, thermite, 
right. We can do thermite. It's it's you know it's just volatile. It does, it's not you know it's not fire. It's just you know it's really concentrated in one area kind of thing. And so, and the the informant was constantly trying to bring it up. And the FBI agent was he had me do some freaking stupid handoff with this plastic explosive thing. And, <laughs> It was all just a bunch of crap. But they were trying so hard to get us to be, you know, bad. And, and we were just like, wow, what are you talking about, man? Um, it didn't work. They didn't have a case. It took them a couple of years. When we got arrested, we went to, um, the FBI agent went in to help us with the, um, with the getting set up at a place where we could cut down this big power line. Um, Mark Davis was going to use an assembly porch on the big IPs. Um, I was going to be a lookout, and so was Mark Baker, and, Mark, and uh, Mike Fain was the FBI agent, and he was going to be there. And he brought his truck, his acetylene, he bought the acetylene, and so he set us up. He was like our benefactor, right? And, um, and then we went to this place. He did the recon with my friend Mark Davis, and the recon was just set up perfect for, a, for, an, for an ambush. And so we're driving over there, and I, I'm freaking out because the, there's some part of me that knows that we're, I'm just going down, but I, I'm just in so much denial about it. I was in denial about it because I had a crush on the FBI agent, and I wasn't listening to my body, which was just really freaking out. So we're driving down there. I see lights going off the roads in front of us and behind us. I'm like, that's weird. We go off the road. I'm, you know, wearing my tennis shoes with my wrapped feet in, in duct tape. And Mark Baker is walking around with planks on his feet. Call him the duck. It's hilarious. <laughs> and then Mark Baker, or Mark Davis, was wearing socks on his shoes so that, you know, our footprints would not. So we're, you know, the over the hill gang. We were a bunch of old aging hippies. We're acting like, you know. So we get out there. The FBI agent, he's, he, the agent is, he's like listening to everything. He's got everything recorded. We recorded the conversation in the truck. When I finally heard the conversation from that, when I was with my lawyer, I was howling with laughter because we were so jacked up on adrenaline and scared to death and all the stuff we were gonna do. And oh my God. So we get out there, and I'm standing there with the FBI agent who's holding a blanket around Mark Davis so that you can't see the settling torch going off, and we see a flare go off, and I'm like, what's that? And then we hear all these metallic clicks, and then we hear, oh, it's the FBI! And I'm like, oh. And it felt like I was in a movie. <laughs> it's like, holy shit, what's really going on? And it, it took a while to sink in. And I heard them say it again because things were starting, people were scuffling around and Mike Fain was scuffling with Mark Davis and, and all of a sudden I just turned around and ran as fast as I could out of there. So the first thing that happened is I got hit in the leg with a, a, a stick that ran into a branch and um, that was the, the tree telling me to pay attention, girlfriend. you got to get really serious about this now. You cannot panic. So. That got my attention, got me settled down. I got into a wash, and we're in the desert, and I'm very familiar with the desert. The desert is not a place of adversity for me. The desert is home for me. I felt quite at home there. As soon as I got over the initial panic and shock, and I started moving through the, <coughs> the desert <coughs> in the wash, and all of a sudden this freaking Black Hawk helicopter turns on its lights, and it flies up right over me, and I'm going, I'm dead. So I climb underneath a tree, a Palo Verde tree, and I just roll up because I know, I take my glasses off immediately, I know that they have lights, <clears throat> they have infrared scopes, they can see me, and I just know they're going to stop me or shoot me or something. So I'm just like, oh my God, I'm going to die. <clears throat> so it flew away, and I untangled myself from the tree. Thank you very much. Started moving again. And as I was moving, I was going towards, because it was in a bowl. It was just like a perfect place for an ambush. And I saw this saddle up there, and I thought, okay, I'm going to go up there. And then I can get a view of where the hell I am. And so I started moving in that direction, and eventually 
Um, and I, oh, I did not get stabbed by one single piece of cactus. Hmm. Not once. In the dark. I had no lights. It was a, a moonless night because that's when we planned it. The moon was going to come up in the, in the morning before dawn. And so it was starlight. And it was, you know, starlight in the, in the mountains is really bright. And so I was able to make my way through, took my glasses off. I'm sort of, you know, going to this deal where I'm moving from this part of me. And, and um, all of a sudden I noticed that there's all these lights. And I turn around and there's lights all the way around me. And they're walking. I'm like, oh, shit. And they're on the ground. And so um, the damn helicopter comes by again. So I dive up underneath the tree again. And I'm like, okay, are you going to wait for me? Are you going to kill me? What are you going to do? And then they flew away. And then I got untangled again. And I start walking towards these guys. And so these guys, they got their infrared scopes, their binoculars, <coughs> their lights. And they have their grenades. And they have guns. And they're snake leggings because they're scared of those badass snakes. <laughs> so they're walking. Stop. They're looking around. One, two, three, four. Stop. Looking around. So I'm walking. One, two, three, four. Stop. I'm a cactus. One, two, three, four. Stop. I'm a tree. One, two. So I walked. I threw them. Oh, wow. So they're like, you know, one, two, three, four, stop. I closed my eyes because I didn't want them to see my, you know, the eyes. Stop. And then when I got on the other side of them, I ran like hell. <laughs> so, but I had to get to the place where I couldn't hear them anymore because I didn't want them to hear me. So that was how I got through them. They're the elite SWAT team. <laughs> they are the anti-terrorist league. <laughs> Be afraid. Ooh. So I got on the other side of them, and yeah, I know I make fun of these bastards, but it, it really, I was in prison for two years, and they trained where I was in prison. And I knew at any time I could walk up to any of those assholes and go and run away, and they would not get me. <laughs> I knew that. So. It's like, wow, really? But the whole thing is not because they're not athletic, not because they're not really strong and they have they can run really fast and they can do all this stuff. It's because their whole relationship with the world is adversarial. They're afraid. They're afraid of themselves. They're afraid of nature. They're afraid of me. They're afraid of you. Especially if we're not afraid. That's the big one that we have on them. And they, it's really not an us and them thing. It's all us, really, really. So we can be an example of no fear. We can be examples to show what it looks like. And I ended up singing a song to the judge when I finally went to trial and finally had to stand in front of the judge. <clears throat> and the song was about showing what it's like to be forever wild, what it looks like, what it feels like. We can't tell somebody. You have to. Um, you have to be an example for it. And so that's kind of what my um, what my activism turned into, and still is. And even then, I mean, I have absolutely. I mean, whenever I hear about sabotage or any of that kind of stuff, I'm usually just you know doing my little happy dance, and I just think it's fabulous. Especially if I know that the people who are doing this work are really connected spiritually to each other and to the earth, then I know. And there's people out there. There's a guy named Rod Coronado, hopefully, that will be coming here in the next couple of weeks, month, month, that I highly encourage you to bring your friends to see and for you to come see. And I don't know, does any of you guys know who Rod Coronado is? Rod Coronado at the tender age of 19 with a friend um, who was sailing around on the Good Ship, uh, Good Shepherd, um, the Sea Shepherd, and he was with a guy named uh, Paul Watson, who's like famous in television now. I can't even believe he's got like War of the Worlds or some shit. He's Whale Wars or something like that. But anyways, <laughs> um, 
he's a uh, captain of this, of this boat, and Rod was on the ship with him and doing all these high seas, high jinks and stuff, and he shows up in Reykjavik in Iceland, and there is a moratorium on whaling. And nobody is whaling except for Iceland, and they have three whaling ships. And so Rod and his friend David walk onto the whaling ships, pull the plug, and sink them in the harbor. <laughs> 19 years old. Then there was only there was one ship that they didn't sink because there was a man on it, and they didn't want to hurt him. They were very, you know. Then they go to the whale processing plant and completely trash it. Completely. I mean, just, you know, hundreds of thousands of dollars worth of damage. And then, the next day, they go public. Say, hi, we were the ones that did that. What are you going to do? And so, Iceland was, you know, being scrutinized by the whole world. And they were like, oh, we're mad, but we can't do anything about it. Because if we did, we'd get in trouble somehow. It would be very embarrassing. So, they didn't do anything with them. And Rod has, Rod is what I would call one of the real honest God warriors on the planet. He's half Yaki, half Mexican. He is a warrior. He is the real deal. So please come to see him because you will be really inspired by him. What I've done is pittance compared to what this guy's gone through and done. He spent over six years in jail. He's been doing this for a long time. And he is still, right now, his campaign is the wolves. And that is what he's focusing on right now. And so you're going to hear about that when you come to see him. And so that means you're going to have to support these guys so they can bring him over. Because we all have to eat, those of us that are on these little trips and stuff. And um, we have bills too. So um, so that's a commercial for Rod Clown. Um, I just adore him. He's one of my favorite people on the planet. I met him in 1988. For the first time, shook his hand, I said, I just want to shake your hand. And I couldn't tell him I was doing what I was doing because it, I was still not in, in public knowledge. That behind you about it, but not him. So, um, so anyways, that's, yeah, that's, that's, uh, that's Rod Coronado. So he's really an amazing soul. And an amazing, amazing actress. He does things that go bump in the night. Um, he has done things that go bump in the night right now. Um, he's just been off probation. It's taken years and years for this to happen, and so he's um, still though. He's not afraid. He's not afraid, and that's the big one. I'm not afraid either, and sometimes I get afraid, but I process the fear. And it's really important to be able to do that. Um, I saw in the trial. We went to the trial. We got arrested in '89. Um, we we're in the trial for. Uh, we waited for the trial for two years, um, and then we went to trial for two months, and then I went to jail for two years on a three-year sentence. Um, the the judge wanted to um, wanted to put me in jail to show me a lesson, and I was like, "Fine, count yourself out." We also went to jail for two months. Mark Baker went to jail for six months. He was in a, a city jail. It was total torture. Um, I was in like Club Fed. It was like a small little satellite. We had a fence this high. Um, there was, you know, a, an outdoor place I could go run every day. There was, you know, I worked at the training center where I picked up bullets while they were shooting or after they were done shooting and, and cleaned their targets and punched FBI agents out in cardboard and um, <laughs> usually put the names on them and, and you know it was really fun. So I had a really easy time of it. Mark Davis went to another um, institution that was, uh, he did four years on a six year sentence. He was the kingpin. Um, that stuff, that's the only thing that um, is in that little booklet. Um, Ilsa had to do five years of probation. It was supervised probation, and that was torture for her. She had to raise her two children. There were six kids involved in this whole deal, and the reason why we did the plea bargain at, at the end is because the people that had the kids wanted to be there for them when they could, and this was going to go on for years. And when Judy Berry got, um, stood up to the feds and said, I want to know who bombed me, and she spent seven years and then died, and there was 12 years when it it finally came to fruition, so there was a jury trial. We did not, we opted out of the jury. Um, 
the same thing happened with Rod Coronado. He decided to do a, um, a plea bargain um, on some of, his, some of his stuff. They have thrown him in jail every time they possibly can get a chance. And uh, they hate him. So um, each one of us that goes through this kind of stuff has to make the decision, how do I want to pre conduct myself through this? And um, there's a lot of people in jail right now that are doing time on things that are less egregious than, than what we did. Uh, times have really changed. And so it's really important for you guys to be supportive of these folks when they get out. Um, we thrash around a lot when we get out. It's like um, anybody here been in the military, gone to gone to overseas and, and come back and went, who the hell am I and where the hell am I? It's it's kind of like that um, because you're changed. I was changed when I came out of prison, and um, and everybody that goes through something that traumatic is changed when they come home. And so it's really important to support your people that come in as much as you can. Um, I don't know. It really, I was supported very well. And when I was in jail, it was international news, we got information, we got people writing to us from every freaking where, and um, it was 20 years ago. So there's a lot more people in jail now for a lot less stuff. So it's something that's just, um, that I just wanted to, you know, our situation was so different than it is now.